Chapter 1 from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. King Arthur and His Knights. Chapter 1 Introduction. On the decline of the Roman power, about five centuries after Christ, the countries of northern Europe were left almost destitute of a national government. Numerous chiefs, more or less powerful, held local sway, as far as each could enforce his dominion, and occasionally those chiefs would unite for a common object, but in ordinary times they were much more likely to be found in hostility to one another. In such a state of things the rights of the humbler classes of society were at the mercy of every assailant, and it is plain that, without some check upon the lawless power of the chiefs, society must have relapsed into barbarism. Such checks were found, first, in the rivalry of the chiefs themselves, whose mutual jealousy made them restraints upon one another, secondly, in the influence of the church, which, by every motive, pure or selfish, was pledged to interpose for the protection of the weak, and lastly, in the generosity and sense of right which, however crushed under the weight of passion and selfishness, dwell naturally in the heart of man. From this last source sprang chivalry, which framed an ideal of the heroic character, combining invincible strength and valor, justice, modesty, loyalty to superiors, courtesy to equals, compassion to weakness, and devotedness to the church, an ideal which, if never met with in real life, was acknowledged by all as the highest model for emulation. The word chivalry is derived from the French cheval, a horse. The word knight, which originally meant boy or servant, was particularly applied to a young man after he was admitted to the privilege of bearing arms. This privilege was conferred on youths of family and fortune only, for the mass of the people were not furnished with arms. The knight, then, was a mounted warrior, a man of rank, or in the service and maintenance of some man of rank, generally possessing some independent means of support, but often relying mainly on the gratitude of those whom he served for the supply of his wants, and often, no doubt, resorting to the means which power confers on its possessor. In time of war the knight was, with his followers, in the camp of his sovereign, or commanding in the field, or holding some castle for him. In time of peace, he was often in attendance at his sovereign's court, gracing with his presence the banquets and tournaments with which princes cheered their leisure. Or he was traversing the country in quest of adventure, professedly bent on redressing wrongs and enforcing rights, sometimes in fulfillment of some vow of religion or of love. These wandering knights were called knights errant. They were welcome guests in the castles of the nobility, for their presence enlivened the dullness of those secluded abodes, and they were received with honor at the abbeys, which often owed the best part of their revenues to the patronage of the knights. But if no castle or abbey or hermitage were at hand, their hardy habits made it not intolerable for them to lie down, supperless, at the foot of some wayside cross, and pass the night. It is evident that the justice administered by such an instrumentality must have been of the rudest description. The force whose legitimate purpose was to redress wrongs might easily be perverted to inflict them. Accordingly, we find in the romances, which, however fabulous in facts, are true as pictures of manners, that a knightly castle was often a terror to the surrounding country, that is, dungeons were full of oppressed knights and ladies, waiting for some champion to appear to set them free, or to be ransomed with money, that hosts of idle retainers were ever at hand to enforce their lord's behests, regardless of law and justice, and that the rights of the unarmed multitude were of no account. This contrariety of fact and theory in regard to chivalry will account for the opposite impressions which exist in men's minds respecting it. While it has been the theme of the most fervid eulogium on the one part, it has been as eagerly denounced on the other. On a cool estimate, we cannot but see reason to congratulate ourselves that it has given way in modern times to the reign of law, and that the civil magistrate, if less picturesque, has taken the place of the mailed champion. 
The Training of a Knight The preparatory education of candidates for knighthood was long and arduous. At seven years of age, the noble children were usually removed from their father's house to the court or castle of their future patron, and placed under the care of a governor, who taught them the first articles of religion, and respect and reverence for their lords and superiors, and initiated them in the ceremonies of a court. They were called pages, valets, or varlets, and their office was to carve, to wait at table, and to perform other menial services which were not then considered humiliating. In their leisure hours they learned to dance and play on the harp, were instructed in the mysteries of woods and rivers, that is, in hunting, falconry, and fishing, and in wrestling, tilting with spears, and performing other military exercises on horseback. At fourteen the page became an esquire, and began a course of severer and more laborious exercises. To vault on a horse in heavy armor, to run, to scale walls, and spring over ditches, under the same encumbrance, to wrestle, to wield the battle-axe for a length of time, without raising the visor or taking breath, to perform with grace all the evolutions of horsemanship, were necessary preliminaries to the reception of knighthood, which was usually conferred at twenty-one years of age, when the young man's education was supposed to be completed. In the meantime, the esquires were no less assiduously engaged in acquiring all those refinements of civility, which formed what was in that age called courtesy. The same castle in which they received their education was usually thronged with young persons of the other sex, and the page was encouraged, at a very early age, to select some lady of the court as the mistress of his heart, to whom he was taught to refer all his sentiments, words, and actions. The service of his mistress was the glory and occupation of a knight, and her smiles, bestowed at once by affection and gratitude, were held out as the recompense of his well-directed valor. Religion united its influence with those of loyalty and love, and the order of knighthood, endowed with all the sanctity and religious awe that attended the priesthood, became an object of ambition to the greatest sovereigns. The ceremonies of initiation were peculiarly solemn. After undergoing a severe fast, and spending whole nights in prayer, the candidate confessed and received the sacrament. He then clothed himself in snow-white garments, and repaired to the church, or the hall, where the ceremony was to take place, bearing a knightly sword suspended from his neck, which the officiating priest took and blessed, and then returned to him. The candidate then, with folded arms, knelt before the presiding knight, who, after some questions about his motives and purposes in requesting admission, administered to him the oaths, and granted his request. Some of the knights present, sometimes even ladies and damsels, handed to him in succession the spurs, the coat of mail, the hauberk, the armlet and gauntlet, and lastly he girded on the sword. He then knelt again before the president, who, rising from his seat, gave him the accolade, which consisted of three strokes, with the flat of a sword, on the shoulder or neck of the candidate, accompanied by the words, In the name of God, of St. Michael, and St. George, I make thee a knight. Be valiant, courteous, and loyal. Then he received his helmet, his shield, and spear, and thus the investiture ended. Freemen, villains, serfs, and clerks. The other classes of which society was composed were, first, freemen, owners of small portions of land independent, though they sometimes voluntarily became the vassals of their more opulent neighbors, whose power was necessary for their protection. The other two classes, which were much the most numerous, were either serfs or villains, both of which were slaves. The serfs were in the lowest state of slavery. All the fruits of their labor belonged to the master whose land they tilled, and by whom they were fed and clothed. The villains were less degraded. Their situation seems to have resembled that of the Russian peasants at this day. Like the serfs, they were attached to the soil, and were transferred with it by purchase, but they paid only a fixed rent to the landlord, and had a right to dispose of any surplus that might arise from their industry. The term clerk was of very extensive import. It comprehended, originally, such persons only as belonged to the clergy or clerical order, 
among whom, however, might be found a multitude of married persons, artisans, or others. But in process of time a much wider rule was established. Every one that could read, being accounted a clerk or clericus, and allowed the, quote, benefit of clergy, end quote, that is, exemption from capital and some other forms of punishment, in case of crime. Tournaments. The splendid pageant of a tournament between knights, its gaudy accessories and trappings, and its chivalrous regulations, originated in France. Tournaments were repeatedly condemned by the church, probably on account of the quarrels they led to, and the often fatal results. The joust, or just, was different from the tournament. In these, knights fought with their lances, and their object was to unhorse their antagonists, while the tournaments were intended for a display of skill and address in evolutions, and with various weapons, and greater courtesy was observed in the regulations. By these it was forbidden to wound the horse, or to use the point of the sword, or to strike a knight after he had raised his visor, or unlaced his helmet. The ladies encouraged their knights in these exercises, they bestowed prizes, and the conqueror's feats were the theme of romance and song. The stands overlooking the ground, of course, were varied in the shapes of towers, terraces, galleries, and pensile gardens, magnificently decorated with tapestry, pavilions, and banners. Every combatant proclaimed the name of the lady whose servant d'amour he was. He was wont to look up to the stand and strengthen his courage by the sight of the bright eyes that were raining their influence on him from above. The knights also carried favors, consisting of scarves, veils, sleeves, bracelets, clasps, in short, some piece of female habiliment, attached to their helmets, shields, or armor. If, during the combat, any of these appendages were dropped or lost, the fair donor would at times send her knight new ones, especially if pleased with his exertions. Male Armor Male armor, of which the hauberk is a species, and which derived its name from maile, a French word for mesh, was of two kinds, plate or scale mail and chain mail. It was originally used for the protection of the body only, reaching no lower than the knees. It was shaped like a carter's frock and bound around the waist by a girdle. Gloves and hose of mail were afterwards added, and a hood, which, when necessary, was drawn over the head, leaving the face alone uncovered. To protect the skin from the impression of the iron network of the chain mail, a quilted lining was employed, which, however, was insufficient, and the bath was used to efface the marks of the armor. The hauberk was a complete covering of double chain mail. Some hauberks opened before, like a modern coat, others were closed like a shirt. The chain mail of which they were composed was formed by a number of iron links, each link having others inserted into it, the whole exhibiting a kind of network, of which, in some instances at least, the meshes were circular, and each link separately riveted. The hauberk was proof against the most violent blow of a sword, but the point of a lance might pass through the meshes, or drive the iron into the flesh. To guard against this, a thick and well-stuffed doublet was worn underneath, under which was commonly added an iron breastplate. Hence the expression, to pierce both plate and mail, so common in the earlier poets. Mail armor continued in general use till about the year 1300, when it was gradually supplanted by plate armor, or suits consisting of pieces or plates of solid iron, adapted to the different parts of the body. Shields were generally made of wood, covered with leather, or some similar substance. To secure them, in some sort, from being cut through by the sword, they were surrounded with a hoop of metal. Helmets The helmet was composed of two parts, the headpiece, which was strengthened within by several circles of iron, and the visor, which, as the name implies, was a sort of grating to see through, so contrived as, by sliding in a groove, or turning on a pivot, to be raised or lowered at pleasure. Some helmets had a further improvement called a bever, from the Italian bevere, to drink. The ventail, or air passage, is another name for this. To secure the helmet from the possibility of falling, or of being struck off, it was tied by several laces to the meshes of the hauberk. Consequently, when a knight was overthrown, 
it was necessary to undo these laces before he could be put to death, though this was sometimes effected by lifting up the skirt of the hauberk and stabbing him in the belly. The instrument of death was a small dagger worn on the right side. Romances In ages when there were no books, when noblemen and princes themselves could not read, history or tradition was monopolized by the storytellers. They inherited, generation after generation, the wondrous tales of their predecessors, which they retailed to the public with such additions of their own as their acquired information supplied them with. Anachronisms became, of course, very common, and errors of geography, of locality, of manners, equally so. Spurious genealogies were invented, in which Arthur and his knights, and Charlemagne and his paladins, were made to derive their descent from Aeneas, Hector, or some other of the Trojan heroes. With regard to the derivation of the word romance, we trace it to the fact that the dialects which were formed in Western Europe, from the admixture of Latin with the native languages, took the name of langue romaine. The French language was divided into two dialects. The river Loire was their common boundary. In the provinces to the south of that river, the affirmative, yes, was expressed by the word auc. In the north it was called oil, we, oui, and hence Dante has named the southern language langue d'oc, and the northern language langue d'oile. The latter, which was carried into England by the Normans, and is the origin of the present French, may be called the French Romaine, and the former the Provençal or Provincial Romaine, because it was spoken by the people of Provence and Languedoc, southern provinces of France. These dialects were soon distinguished by very opposite characters. A soft and enervating climate, a spirit of commerce encouraged by an easy communication with other maritime nations, the influx of wealth, and a more settled government, may have tended to polish and soften the diction of the provincials, whose poets, under the name of troubadours, were the masters of the Italians, and particularly of Petrarch. Their favorite pieces were Cervantes, satirical pieces, love songs, and tensons, which last were a sort of dialogue in verse between two poets, who questioned each other on some refined points of love's casuistry. It seems the Provencials were so completely absorbed in these delicate questions as to neglect and despise the composition of fabulous histories of adventure and knighthood, which they left in a great measure to the poets of the northern part of the kingdom, called Trouvers. At a time when chivalry excited universal admiration, and when all the efforts of that chivalry were directed against the enemies of religion, it was natural that literature should receive the same impulse, and that history and fable should be ransacked to furnish examples of courage and piety that might excite increased emulation. Arthur and Charlemagne were the two heroes selected for this purpose. Arthur's pretensions were that he was a brave, though not always a successful warrior. He had withstood with great resolution the arms of the infidels, that is to say of the Saxons, and his memory was held in the highest estimation by his countrymen, the Britons, who carried with them into Wales and into the kindred country of Amorica, or Brittany, the memory of his exploits, which their national vanity insensibly exaggerated, till the little prince of the Silures, South Wales, was magnified into the conqueror of England, of Gaul, and of the greater part of Europe. His genealogy was gradually carried up to an imaginary Brutus, and to the period of the Trojan War, and a sort of chronicle was composed in the Welsh, or Armorican language, which, under the pompous title of The History of the Kings of Britain, was translated into Latin by Geoffrey of Monmouth about the year 1550. The Welsh critics consider the material of the work to have been an older history, written by St. Talion, Bishop of St. Asaph, in the 7th century. As to Charlemagne, though his real merits were sufficient to secure his immortality, it is impossible that his holy wars against the Saracens should not become a favorite topic for fiction. Accordingly, the fabulous history of these wars was written, probably towards the close of the 11th century, by a monk who, thinking it would add dignity to his work to embellish it with a contemporary name, boldly ascribed it to Turpin, who was Archbishop of Reims about the year 773. 
these fabulous chronicles were for a while imprisoned in languages of local only or of professional access. Both Turpin and Geoffrey might indeed be read by ecclesiastics, the sole Latin scholars of those times, and Geoffrey's British original would contribute to the gratification of Welshmen, but neither could become extensively popular till translated into some language of general and familiar use. The Anglo-Saxon was at that time used only by a conquered and enslaved nation. The Spanish and Italian languages were not yet formed. The Norman French alone was spoken and understood by the nobility in the greater part of Europe, and therefore was a proper vehicle for a new mode of composition. That language was fashionable in England before the conquest, and became, after that event, the only language used at the court of London. As the various conquests of the Normans, and the enthusiastic valor of that extraordinary people, had familiarized the minds of men with the most marvelous events, their poets eagerly seized the fabulous legends of Arthur and Charlemagne, translated them into the language of the day, and soon produced a variety of imitations. The adventures attributed to these monarchs and to their distinguished warriors, together with those of many other traditionary or imaginary heroes, composed by degrees that formidable body of marvelous histories which, from the dialect in which the most ancient of them were written, were called romances. Metrical Romances the earliest form in which romances appear is that of a rude kind of verse. In this form it is supposed they were sung or recited at the feasts of princes and knights in their baronial halls. The following specimen of the language and style of Robert de Beauvais, who flourished in 1257, is from Sir Walter Scott's Introduction to the Romance of Sir Tristram. Ne vois pas emi dire, ici divers le matere, Entre sus qui solant cunter, y de le cunte tristren parle. I will not say too much about it, so diverse is the matter, among those who are in the habit of telling and relating the story of Tristran. This is a specimen of the language which was in use among the nobility of England in the ages immediately after the Norman conquest. The following is a specimen of the English that existed at the same time among the common people. Robert de Brune, speaking of his Latin and French authorities, says, Alls they have written and said, Have I all in mine English laid, In simple speech as I couth, That is lightest in man's mouth. All for the luff of simple men, That strange English cannot ken. The strange English being the language of the previous specimen. It was not till toward the end of the thirteenth century that the prose romances began to appear. These works generally began with disowning and discrediting the sources from which in reality they drew their sole information. As every romance was supposed to be a real history, the compilers of those in prose would have forfeited all credit if they had announced themselves as mere copyists of the minstrels. On the contrary, they usually state that, as the popular poems upon the matter in question contain many lessings, they had been induced to translate the real and true history of such and such a knight from the original Latin or Greek, or from the ancient British or Amorican authorities, which authorities existed only in their own assertion. A specimen of the style of the prose romances may be found in the following extract from one of the most celebrated and latest of them, the Mort de Arthur, of Sir Thomas Mallory, of the date 1485. From this work much of the contents of this volume has been drawn, with as close an adherence to the original style as was thought consistent with our plan of adapting our narrative to the taste of modern readers. It is notoriously known through the universal world that there have been ix worthy and the best that ever were that is to what their paynims three Jews and three Christian men. As for the paynims, they were to fore the incarnation of Christ, which were named the first Hector of Troy, the second Alessander the Great, and the third Julius Caesar, Emperor of Rome, for whom thy stories been well know and had. And as for the three Jews, which were also to fore the incarnation of our Lord, of whom the first was Duke Josue, which brought the children of Israel into the land of Behest, 
the second David, king of Jerusalem, and the third Judas Maccabeus. Of these three the Bible rehearseth all their noble histories and acts, and cite the said Incarnation have been the noble Christian men stalled and admitted through the universal world to the nombre of the ex beste and worthy, of whom was first the noble Arthur, whose noble acts I purpose to write in this person book here following. The second was Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, of whom the story is had in many places, both in French and English, and the third and last was Godfrey of Boulogne. End of chapter 1